Hi everyone, how did life on ancient Earth begin? This is a big open question in science, with far-reaching implications about evolution and whether we are alone in the universe. So far, we haven't found evidence of extraterrestrial life. But now, groundbreaking new research in abiogeneticis suggests that life may be far more prevalent throughout the universe than we ever realized. Keep watching to learn more. This video has three sections. What is life? Theories on the origin of life? And metabolism first theories. First section, what is life anyway? There's no commonly accepted definition of life, but let's go with NASA's definition which is as follows. Life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. This definition excludes artificial intelligence, but includes everything on Earth and pretty much everything you could imagine in the cosmos. And why should we care about the origin of life? It tells us a lot about how common life may be in the universe outside of Earth, and whether we might expect to run into extraterrestrials anytime soon. It also tells us a lot about how we might expect our own evolutionary process to go in the future. The first thing to know about life is that it always evolves towards increasing complexity and sophistication. If we look at the probable steps of the evolution of life throughout Earth's history, it might look something like this. Starting with the formation of organic molecules, and then moving on to cyclic reactions that actually create energy and create more of themselves, and then towards increasingly sophisticated molecules that can actually encode information and include that in their self-replication. That might actually be the first step that actually counts as life, is actually doing Darwinian evolution. And then the emergence of cell membranes, and then multicellular organisms, and so on and so on. In general, the focus is on generating energy, self-replication, and containing information and replicating that information. If you have all three of those things, then evolution can really take off. In more recent terms, you've had the evolution of humans and you've had layer upon layer of our brains evolving, most recently the neocortex, which allows consciousness and language and so on. And now with our own technology, we've accelerated evolution even faster. It's a pretty common trend that the component that's undergoing evolution actually changes, and that allows the rate of change to accelerate. This isn't an accident. It allows organisms that are more and more fit to survive to evolve more and more quickly, so they outcompete any other options. So this is a very interesting process, but how did everything start out in the beginning? Second section, theories on the origin of life. A lot of this video is based on Sabine Hassenfelder's video on the origin of life, which brought my attention to new studies in the area. I'd like to acknowledge that video, and if you're interested in watching it, it's the first link in the description below. So let's think a bit about how life could actually evolve on Earth. Earth was formed four and a half billion years ago, and originally it was very, very hot. It took a long time for the planet to cool down enough that water was actually not boiling, in other words, below 100 degrees Celsius, and the atmosphere was originally lots of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water vapor, and all kinds of strange fumes from volcanic activity. There are four general approaches that scientists use when thinking about how life could have evolved in such an inhospitable environment. They are to think bottom up from the molecules that were already present on on ancient Earth, to go top down, starting from life that we can see today and figuring out how that may have formed, looking at an individual component of life like RNA and trying to figure out how that may have formed, and finally, metabolism first approaches which try to figure out chemical reactions that actually generate energy. We'll talk about all of these approaches in turn, and the last approach is the most interesting in my opinion, so it has its own section. So first, bottom-up approaches try to think about what are the basic building blocks that would need to have been in place to actually start forming life. The basic building blocks are organic molecules, which are carbon carbon-carbon bonds, or sometimes carbon-hydrogen bonds. One of the easiest ways to get these bonds on ancient Earth would have been combining carbon dioxide with hydrogen, and you get the carbon-hydrogen bond that way. However, this reaction only works when you don't have oxygen around, because otherwise the molecules will simply bind with the oxygen instead. It's uncertain how much oxygen there was in this early atmosphere, or how long it existed. This is long before plants and animals, of course, so the existence of oxygen would have been purely a chemical matter. I don't know if you've heard about the very large Mars-sized object that actually crashed into planet Earth a very long time ago and formed the moon, it's thought that that collision may have caused a lot of oxygen to be formed in the atmosphere. So that's one possible source. There were also a lot of underwater thermal vents, basically volcanic activity happening underwater, which has been cited as a very likely place for the first steps of life to evolve. As described by Nick Lane, there's a lot of electrochemical gradients, a lot of temperature gradients and so on that are all very important for those initial steps of building blocks towards organic molecules. There also would have been pools of water lying around the surface of the planet and potentially lots of lightning going on, which could have provided the initial spark for some chemical reactions as well. The initial spark of life, so to speak. If we think about the top-down approach, biologists talk about the so-called last universal common ancestor, which is the organism that must have been the common parent for almost all life alive today. And the theory is that this is probably a form of bacteria from between 3.2 to 3.8 billion years ago. There are a number of properties in terms of chemical reactions and chemical processes that we can infer about this last universal common ancestor, but that really doesn't get us all the way there. Like I mentioned earlier, life is a sort of series of stepping stones, each of which is a little more complicated than the last, but those initial steps probably didn't leave any record of their existence, either in the fossil record or in the data that we can infer about this last universal common ancestor. 
There could have been intermediate stages that were built upon, but there could also have been intermediate stages that were then replaced by new mechanisms. So it's hard to look very far back in time, right to the origin when you're looking from a top-down approach. In terms of thinking about the fundamental building blocks of life, as I mentioned, the earliest layers may have been built upon and then lost, but what is the earliest layer that we know about that could actually count as a real building block? The best candidate is RNA, which today reads information encoded in DNA strands and produces proteins from that encoded information. But even without DNA, RNA itself can self-replicate and carry information. RNA could be an earlier building block than DNA in terms of this sequence of steps of life. Actually, one of the benefits of the dual strands of DNA is that mutations can sometimes be detected and corrected. This allows a more complex set of information to be reliably passed along to one's descendants. I'm not a biologist, but apparently the basic building blocks you would need for RNA are nucleobases, nucleotides, and then finally you can form RNA itself. Of course, these are all quite complex molecules, and the chance of them forming purely by accident is very, very small. There are probably even more intermediate steps below the RNA and nucleobases and so on. So where do the nucleobases come from? Well, you would have to use the strategies in the other three approaches here to figure that out, or you could punt on the problem because we've actually found nucleobases on asteroids, or you could punt on the problem because we've actually found nucleobases on meteorites that came from outer space. So this does lead to a theory called panspermia, which says that perhaps the initial building blocks of life, such as nucleobases, came to Earth via an asteroid from somewhere else. Again, how it may have formed somewhere else is open to question. In this last section, we'll talk about the last of the four categories of scientific theories on the origin of life, specifically metabolism first theories. Metabolism is simply the ability to extract energy from the environment. So a metabolism first theory says that the first building block of life must have been some sort of chemical reaction that could actually extract energy from its environment and sustain itself. Stuart Kaufman was one of the first to propose this type of theory in his book, At Home in the Universe. He and Joanna Xavier from the University College London and some other co-authors as well actually wrote two papers on this subject in 2020 and 2022. Their titles are Autocatalytic Chemical Reactions at the Origin of Metabolism and Small Molecule Autocatalytic Networks are Universal Metabolic Fossils. The links are in the description below if you feel sleepy. These papers talk about autocatalytic sets, which are basically a set of chemicals that undergo chemical reactions that produce products. And if there are any catalysts needed for those chemical reactions, then they produce their own catalysts as well. In other words, the reactions can continue indefinitely in theory, and the reactions are creating energy at the same time. So you basically have a very primitive form of life that is nothing but chemical reactions that are constantly operating, generating more of themselves, and generating energy in the process. As we talked about earlier, if you add one small thing, which is the ability to encode information into this chemical soup, then you basically have the perfect basis for Darwinian evolution. You have something that can create more of itself, you have something that creates energy, and you have something that can carry information about itself and how it was constructed to future generations. But anyway, autocatalytic sets are basically that, but with no information encoding inherent in it. The first paper looked at single-celled organisms that still exist today and tried to figure out all the chemical reactions that are happening amongst them. It turns out that those sets of chemical reactions from all these different organisms actually had an overlap. And moreover, within that overlap, there is actually a really small set of chemical reactions that were autocatalytic, that would be able to create more of themselves, create their own catalysts, and generate energy. This set of 172 core reactions is actually capable of generating nucleobases and amino acids. Remember we talked about nucleobases earlier? That's right, that's the missing link, the first step in the ladder to forming RNA. This is an amazing discovery. It actually shows that with some reactions that we already know are present in life, we can figure out how to automatically create nucleobases. And furthermore, those chemical reactions themselves are self-sustaining, which means they could have existed prior to life. They could have been one of those intermediate building blocks that we mentioned earlier. The second follow-up paper addressed the question of how likely are those 172 reactions and the elements needed for them to actually occur. So the first paper was kind of top-down, starting from life, and then thinking about that set of 172 that would be sufficient to go upwards. And the second paper goes bottom-up. It starts by talking about different autocatalytic networks that could have formed in ancient Earth and tries to figure out, could you get to those 172 reactions or something like it from those very simple small molecule autocatalytic networks, as they call them. In other words, molecules that could have arisen just out of pure chance because they're not actually all that complicated. And what the paper found is that in at least 2,700 different autocatalytic sets, again, these are things that could have arisen out of the ether, so to speak, when lightning strikes just out of small molecules that may have randomly formed on early Earth. So in that list of 2,700 autocatalytic sets, 
there were about 300 reactions in common. The paper doesn't actually say whether the 172 from the first paper is an, has an overlap with the 300 from the second paper, but even if there isn't a direct one-to-one -one mapping there, it's a very promising result. Of this list of 2,700 autocatalytic sets, which are themselves sets of reactions going on, the 300 most common reactions that are found in basic life processes are actually present in that list of 2,700. In other words, just by using basic building blocks that might have been present on early Earth and thinking about the autocatalytic sets that might have come from those, you can end up with the 300 most common reactions that are needed to actually form the building blocks of life. I don't know if those 172 from the original paper, a subset of that 300 or not, but regardless, it's a strong result. So let me break it down one more time. Basically, you can have sets of chemicals that can react with each other, which are called autocatalytic sets, because they produce their own catalysts. When you look at all these different autocatalytic sets that could have arisen in early Earth, you find that in 2,700 of them, you can end up getting a lot of really useful reactions. So that's the bottom up half of the argument. And then thinking a bit from the top down, starting not from 300 reactions, but instead from 172 reactions, you can already get really useful building blocks, including nucleobases, which are the first step in the ladder to RNA, which itself might have been one of the first of the self-replicating energy producing entities that could actually encode information. In other words, it would count as the first form of life. And what's more, when you start from the bottom of that argument, there are so many different ways that you can actually go upwards. In other words, given the conditions in which autocatalytic networks of chemical reactions can arise, it's probably very likely, given enough time, for you to actually end up with mechanisms that start encoding information and thus kick off Darwinian evolution. Translation, life might be much more common than we thought in the universe. Or in the words of an academic paper, molecular reproduction may be much more common in the universe than hitherto predicted. Finally, in conclusion, we talked about the origin of life in four different ways that scientists think we might have gotten there. We spend the most time talking about metabolism first theories because of these two breakthrough papers in 2020 and 2022. Sabine Hossenfelder actually mentioned that she wasn't sure why this wasn't headline news all over the world. And I sort of agree, it's a big deal. We have at least theoretical foundation for those initial building blocks, those initial intermediate steps on the ladder that forms life. Life. Remember, life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And in the case of these metabolism first theories, that means finding an autocatalytic set. In other words, a set of chemical reactions that can produce themselves and can produce all necessary catalysts and generate information. And that's not quite life on its own. You need to add the information bearing component, which is for example in RNA. But again, these papers showed that from these autocatalytic sets, you could get to nucleobases, which would let you get to nucleotides, which would let you get to RNA. So we have a true path forward for life arising from the ether. If you liked this video, check out my previous video about why artificial general intelligence might be closer than we think. It's a good reminder that humans may just be one step along the path as intelligence continues to evolve. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.